In this video, we are going to go in depth with PS2 emulation on Xbox Series X and S. So you just got RetroArch installed on your Xbox Series X or S using dev mode or retail mode and want to play a selection of PS2 games on it but have no idea how to do so. Well, you've come to the right spot because I am going to show you just a lot of things about PS2 emulation in this video and hopefully help you get it all set up and running. Now, the one prerequisite is that you are on Xbox Series X or S. If you are an Xbox One user, do not waste your time trying to do PS2 emulation. You are not going to get playable speeds on most anything. It's not worth wasting your time. You need the faster CPUs found in the newer consoles. I guess one other prerequisite is that you already have RetroArch installed because we're not going to go over the setup process again. So refer back to one of the install videos on how to do that. There's retail mode or dev mode. Take your pick. But let's go ahead and dive in. All right, we're gonna get started over on a computing device of some kind to get things prepped and ready to go for PS2 emulation. So some of the things you're gonna need, you're going to need a selection of PS2 games and you're gonna need a PS2 BIOS file. Let's go ahead and start off with the BIOS file first. BIOS files can come in two different formats. You can have a multi-bin format like you see here for my two different BIOS files. I actually have two BIOS files here, so yeah. Anyway. You'll either have a multi-file formatted BIOS, which you get from directly dumping them from a PS2 using PCSX2's BIOS dumper tool, and that's what these two are for. Or you might find a merged BIOS file if you're resorting to the shady parts of the net. You need to make sure that you have a good BIOS file, otherwise you're just going to get black screens, crashes to dev mode, or home screens. Like, your BIOS file is very, very important. So, for those of you that actually have a PS2 still and are looking to dump your own BIOS files, I do have a couple of tutorials on how to do that. The Slim method is definitely the easiest, as it doesn't require a pre-modified console, whereas the FATs do. But, I mean, modding a PS2 in this day and age isn't too difficult, so you got this. But links to these will be in the description below. But once you've sourced a BIOS file, if you have multi-file BIOS files, make sure they're all named the same thing outside of their extensions. That way you know for sure that they're proper. But now we just need to build the file system required for PCSX2 to detect your BIOS file. There's two methods of doing this. You can just make a new folder, name it PCSX2, open that folder, and inside of it make a new folder, and name it BIOS. And then once you have that made, you can drag your BIOS files right in. And that's ready to go over to your system folder in RetroArch. Alternatively, you can download my Xbox RetroArch Files zip folder here. And once that is downloaded, you can just get it extracted. And it'll give you this folder just titled Xbox RetroArch Files. And inside is a pre-made PCSX2 folder with that BIOS folder. And then you can just drag your BIOS files right into there. Now this folder does come with a number of extra systems, including PSP and Dolphin, Final Burn Neo's High Score Dat, and Neo Geo CD BIOS files. So if you're planning on getting multiple systems set up, here's a good place to uh, get some things going. Once you have that PCSX2 folder made, we just need to get it transferred on over to our RetroArch system folder. So go ahead and open up Durango FTP. This is just showing it in dev mode. If you're on retail mode, just open Durango and tell it to start the server. And now back over on your computing device, you can use a file explorer or an FTP program to load up into your Durango file share. So I actually mapped the network location for my Durango. You can do this by adding a network location in Windows, choose specific network location, type in the uh, address for your Xbox there and press next. But access your Durango FTP file share Go into your local folder, find your RetroArch folder, local state, system. Now in my initial setup tutorials, I already copied all the BIOS files over, but we're just going to go ahead and recopy them over. So again, if you have, if you made your own PCSX2 folder, you can just copy it in. Or if you're just grabbing my pre-made folders and you put your BIOS files within the PCSX2 folder, you can copy all of these in as well if you want to. Either method, doesn't matter. But once those are in place, just go ahead and minimize uh, your Durango FTP. We'll come back to that in a second. 
But we are all done with the BIOS and system folder setup portion of this video. All right, so the next thing we need are PS2 games. There are a number of supported formats that PS2 games can be in. The most common that you're gonna find are ISO or bin files for DVD or CD based games. But heading over to the PCSX2 documentation on the RetroArch website, you can see that a number of different formats are also supported, including CISO, CHUD, CSO, old school MDF and Nero images, GZIP, and then for multi-disc games, you can make M3U files. Now, all my games are just in their normal ISO and bin format here, but if you want to convert these to CHUD format to save on disk space, I have prepared a folder here called PS2 ISO to CHUD that I will have a link to in the description below. And you can just extract this, and it'll give you two, uh, two files here. You've got CHUDman and then the PS2 ISO to CHUD.bat executable to convert all of these ISO files into a CHUD format. It won't touch the bin file. This one's just specifically for ISOs. But add these to your PS2 um, image directory, where you have your game stored, and then just run the bat file. And it will compress your ISOs into CHUD format. Now, depending on the amount of games that you have, this could take a while. So just bear with it. Once that program is finished converting all of your games over, you're going to see that you have multiple copies of them now, so you can just go ahead and delete the ISO originals if you no longer need them or move them to a different folder. Doesn't matter. And there we go. Now, I have a couple of multi-disc games in here as well that I'm just going to place into their own folders, so that way they don't... It just looks nicer to me. But anyway, I'm just going to make a folder for these real quick. And there we go. Now, since these are multi-disc games, we could also make an M3U file here to allow them to show up as a single game in a playlist when we make one. So process, to do this, you make a text document and you can name it whatever you want. I just choose to use the game title, of course. But open up that text document and paste in the full file name of both disks or how many disks there happen to be. And once you have both of those in, you can save the file. And now we just need to rename the extension from .txt to m3u. And it's going to get mad about us changing the extensions, that's fine. If for whatever reason you can't see the extensions on your files, under Windows you can go into View and make sure the file name extensions checkbox here is checked. But now I'm just going to do the same thing for this game as well. And once again, rename it to M3U. And there we go. That is our basic PS2 game setup format. So multi-disc games, single file games, and then CD-based games are just going to be bin files. I'm not going to bother compressing this game because it's so small to begin with. But... Once you have your games good to go, we just need to place them onto our USB drive if we're using a retail mode or a USB focused dev mode install, or the internal SSD if you're doing an SSD dev mode install. So going back into our uh, Durango FTP folder here, remember we left it up earlier. If we back out to the main uh, file structure, you can actually access your USB drives from this file explorer, which is really awesome. So that way you don't have to unplug and replug your USB drives if you uh, choose not to. Transfer speeds are going to be slower than plugging it directly into a computer, but hey, points for extra points for laziness here, right? E drive is where USB drives are typically on on dev mode. Under uh, retail, they'll be under D typically. And then for uh, SSD users, you're going to go into S, program files, Windows apps. Find your RetroArch folder, the one with the X64. Uh, you'll have created a games folder in here during initial setup. And then you would just uh, make a PS2 games folder and copy it in there. But I am using USB, so I have them under a folder named games in here. 
And I already copied a bunch over during the initial setup tutorial, but I'm just going to delete those right now and replace them with the Chud versions. And I'm just going to copy these over the network, so we will resume once these have finished transferring. Once your games are stored onto your preferred storage medium, whether that's USB or the internal SSD, and you got those BIOS files placed, double check the folder structure and directory once again on those, please. Local folder, RetroArch folder, local state, system, PCSX2, BIOS and then your BIOS files. That is the number one point of failure for so many people out there, so just make sure you have those in the right spot, and you should be good to go. But we have all the files we need, we have them placed, we're ready to start playing games. So now back over on our Xbox, we can stop Durango FTP, and just quit out of it. And now go ahead and boot into RetroArch. So from here, we can begin loading up our content. One method of doing so, go to load content, navigate to the directory where you stored your games. So for dev mode USB users, that'll be under E, games, um, whatever you happen to store them, it doesn't really matter, but then you can just choose a game, choose a core, tell it to run. If you are on retail mode using USB, they will be under your D drive, same thing as this E drive. But if you are on dev mode and using the SSD to store your games, those will be located under S, Program Files, Windows Apps, find your RetroArch folder, the one that ends in X64 after the version number, find your games folder, find your games. And if for whatever reason your S drive isn't showing up, you will find them under D, Development Files, Windows Apps, RetroArch folder games and there you go i don't personally care for this method i like to make game playlists instead so that way i have quick access to them over here on the left so head down to import content and we are going to go to manual scan you could try doing a scan directory but ps2 games seem to crash it a bit still so manual scan for the win for ps2 but just navigate to where your games are stored so for me i'm on dev mode using usb so they'll be under e and then I'll just find my PS2 games folder, and I'm going to tell it to scan this directory. Now for system name, you need to press uh, up on your D-pad, so that way you get to Sony PlayStation 2 much quicker. Default core, same thing, press up on your D-pad and find Sony PS2 PCSX2. Next up, I'm going to turn scan recursively off because I have games separated into subfolders that are multi-disc, and I don't want to have multiple playlist entries for those discs, so I'm going to come back in and do another scan for those in just a moment. If you have your game separated into subfolders that aren't multi-disc, though, make sure you have scan recursively on. You can leave scan side archives off, we're not doing arcade stuff, so we can just go down and start the scan. Alright, so now that that scan's done, I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to go to File Extensions, and I'm going to type in M3U for those multi-disc games, so that way it only picks up the M3U files in the scan, and now I'm going to turn scan recursively back on and tell it to start the scan. And now when I leave the manual scan folder, I have a PS2 playlist entry here, and it has all of my games showing up here as intended, and my multi-disc Xenosaga games show up as a single entry. But now to play a game, all we need to do is choose one, press A on it, and tell it to run. And you should be greeted by the PS2 BIOS with a little note down there saying it created a memory card in slot 1. And from here you can begin just playing your PS2 games as you normally would. Now when you first start playing a PS2 game, it will probably ask you to format the memory card you have in slot 1. So just go ahead and do so when it asks, otherwise you won't be able to save. So the memory card is unformatted in memory card slot 1. Do you wish to format? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. And once that's done, you will be able to start playing through your games just like you would on a normal PS2. Just remember that PCSX2 within RetroArch does not support save states as of this time, so you will need to make sure to save in-game like you would on a PS2. Now, for the most part, PS2 emulation on PCSX2 and Xbox Series X and S is pretty solid. There are a number of games that will not work as well due to the hardware, the emulator, just couple of different combinations, but overall a lot of things work very well. 
But if you're all done playing a certain PS2 game, you can access your RetroArch quick menu with the hotkey you set up during initial RetroArch setup, close the content, back out, and just load up another game. So I want to show you an example of a game that might not run so well here, and that's Baldur's Gate 2. And sometimes you might just get a crash when you go directly from game to game, so just uh, quit out of RetroArch if that happens, and just load back in. Sometimes it's actually playlist related as well, so sometimes you might just end up on a black screen during playlists, but typically a restart will uh, get you sorted. So here's Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2, again a very demanding game in certain regards, so there's just some things that you aren't going to get full speed out of on the Xbox Series X version of uh, PCSX2 at the moment. There's moments where it runs just fine, but you are going to experience momentary slowdowns or prolonged moments of slowdowns, just really depending on what's happening on screen. Need for Speed Underground is another one of those games where it runs mostly fine, but there are numerous moments of slowdown depending on what you're doing. Now one thing I'd like to make mention of here as you begin diving into your game's library, the PCSX2 wiki is going to be your best friend on getting optimal settings for each of your games. Not every game needs specific settings, but for ones that do, it's an invaluable resource. So just find a game that you are looking to play, I have 007 Nightfire for example, and if there's any specific settings that it needs to have set, it usually lists them here in the known issues. But let's say you've been playing a number of PS2 games now, and your memory card is starting to get full. To remedy this, go into your RetroArch Quick Menu, head down to the Options tab. You'll see a little Memory Cards tab here. Go in there, and we're going to turn on a shared 32 megabyte card for slot 2 real quick. Once that's set, just back out, go up to System, and we're going to tell it to boot to the BIOS. And now, we will close our content, and go up to the main menu here, load core, find your PCSX2 core, and then just tell it to start. Ay ay ay. And again, you might experience things where you need to restart between any time running a PS2 game, it's friggin' awesome. There we go. So you'll see at the bottom there, it created my shared 32 megabyte memory card. And now we're on the main PS2 menu, just like a real console, and we could go into the browser. We'll have two different memory cards here. So memory card two is unformatted, so we want to format it. And once that's finished, we can go into memory card one. And hey, we have a number of different games here. Let's go ahead and transfer Baldur's Gate. Let's copy that over to memory card slot 2. And then we could delete it from slot 1. So that way we don't lose our save, but it's not taking up our valuable slot 1 space. And there it is. We still have the save. So, that's how you will handle memory card management. If you happen to fill up your 32 megabyte second card, well, you might want to dump it to a PC and uh, just let it create a new one. But once you are done in the BIOS menu, go into Options, System, and turn Boot to BIOS back off. And then we could just close the content. Now let's talk about multi-disc games here real quick. There's a couple steps we need to do when it comes to multi-disc games to kind of prep for them. So, if you go into your RetroArch Quick Menu while you have a multi-disc game loaded, we're going to press B to back out of the Quick Menu and go back to our main RetroArch screen here. And we're going to head up to Settings. And the first thing we're going to do in here is head down to User Interface. And we're going to turn off Pause Content when Menu is active. We have to have this option off on Xbox, 
just so it registers disk swaps. And now we're just going to go ahead and back out there. Head up to the main menu. Now head over to the quick menu. You'll notice that your button inputs are uh, occurring in the game as well as on the, the menu because it's not paused anymore. It's fine. But now we're going to go down to overrides. And we're going to save core overrides. This way it will save the fact that we aren't pausing the menu just for the PS2 emulator and not other ones that don't need it. Alternatively, you could do it per game, but your choice, really, there. But to change out disks, you'll head up to Disk Control. You're going to tell it to eject a disk. And if you made M3U files like I showed you, it will uh, have a current disk index selection here. So you can press A on this and see which disk it is specifically. But then you can change the disk and tell it to insert. And then the swap should occur as it's needed. But now let's go ahead and talk about some of the core options available to us within PCSX2. This is where the fun begins. So going into our RetroArch Quick menu, we can scroll down to Options. So the first set of options are the system options. We sort of looked at this earlier when we went to the boot to BIOS. But our first option here is to choose our PS2's BIOS file. So I put two BIOS files in my system folder so I could choose between them here. If you only have one BIOS file, you will not be able to choose between them. It'll just choose the one you got. Next up, you can set the preferred language for your BIOS file. Next up, we have fast loading. This will reduce load times in games. Not every game is compatible, so I don't personally like to use it, but you could check compatibility lists and things like that and see which games work with it and which ones do not. Next up, fast boot. This will bypass the PS2 loading screen if you don't want to see it every time you load up a game. Boot to BIOS. We went over this a little bit earlier, lets you boot to the BIOS screen and uh, manage your memory cards. Next up, the memory card page. We've got slot one. So you can make this an eight megabyte or 32 megabyte card. If you haven't started playing games yet, 32 megabyte would uh, be good. Not all games are compatible with higher memory cards. So for compatibility's sake, eight megabyte is better. And that's why I like having a 32 meg one in the second slot, just for those games that don't work with higher capacity memory cards. Next up, video options. Skip over renderer, don't mess with it, leave it on auto. And we can go down to internal resolution, and this is where we can begin upscaling our games. The GPUs in the Xbox Series X and S are really good, so you can upscale these quite a bit. But if you start to notice lag in places that you didn't have lag before, just go ahead and crank it back down. So for me personally, I typically stay around 3 or 4x scaling as my personal choice, but... A lot of games work just fine in full 4K. Again, try it out for yourself, see what you like, see if it's running okay, choose accordingly. Next up, deinterlacing mode. You could leave this on automatic, but there is also just a number of options to choose from here. So, I mean, we got Bob deinterlacing, Blend deinterlacing, Weave deinterlacing, or no interlacing. Then there is also this no interlacing patch that's built into the RetroArch version of PCSX2 that basically forces your games into a progressive mode, and it's pretty cool. Now, not every game has a patch for this, so it might not work for all of them, but still worth giving it a shot. And most of the options that you're going to set here in the quick menu do require a content restart, so don't be surprised if they don't take effect immediately. Next up, aspect ratio. You can choose between 4x3 and 16x9. You can enable widescreen patches here. There are a number built into the RetroArch version of PCSX2, so that way you can play your games in 16x9 with the applied cheats. Again, not every game is going to have it, but for the ones that do, it's pretty cool. And if you turn those on, make sure you set your output to widescreen. Next up, 60fps patches. Same thing as deinterlacing mode, widescreen patches. It's basically a patch that will make your games run at higher frame rates. This will cause performance hits depending on the game on the hardware some games might not support it right so it's give it a shot if it works cool if it doesn't turn it off type deal next up fxaa so anti-aliasing you can turn that on or off anisotropic filtering you can increase this up to 16 times dithering you can enable or disable dithering and have it scaled to the content of your game Texture filtering options, we have Nearest, Bilinear Forced, Bilinear PS2 Default, or Bilinear Forced Excluding Sprites. I prefer PS2 Default myself, gives you the proper look in my mind, but you can try them all out. There's a nice little description here in the text that tells you what each of them do. 
Mit mapping, leave this on automatic. Next up, conservative buffer allocation, leave this on. Accurate date, leave this on. Uh, frame skip, just yeah, we're not. I'm not gonna cover frame skip. I not no, just just no. All right. Next up, gamepad. Enable rumble. If you don't like having rumble on your controller, you can turn on or off here. Rumble intensity. You can set the strength of the rumble effect here. Next up, left and right stick dead zones. You can increase or decrease dead zone effects here, just depending on how your controller is. All right. Next up, emulation tab. Enable cheats. If you want to use cheats for your PS2 games, you can turn this option on, and then in that PCSX2 folder we placed in the system folder earlier, you can make a new cheats directory and load your PNAC, PNATCH, however you want to pronounce that, you load that file in there, and when you load up your game, should load it up. I'm not going to cover it more than that at this time. I might come back and do a dedicated cheats video later. I really don't like cheats, but yeah, there we go. Next up, speed hack presets. This is set to safe by default. You can set this to balance on Xbox and not really have any uh, penalties. Might help with a few games that are barely stuttering. I don't recommend going past aggressive. Like, this is not really useful. Next up, V-Syncs and MTGSQ. This is set to 2 by default to help with performance. But if you find input lag to be a little bit undesirable, you could go a little bit lower here and see if it helps you out. Next up, we have a bunch of Emotion Engine um, settings here, as well as uh, VU settings. Again, the PCSX2 wiki is going to be your friend on if you need to change these values. I don't recommend really messing with these unless it says to in the wiki. The default values are great for the overwhelming majority of things. It's just those certain games where you might need to change something. So PCSX2 wiki will be your best friend. And that goes the same for this hacks page. There are a ton of of different hacks to like fix graphics or fix games to run in the first place. And the PCSX2 wiki is going to tell you exactly which ones you need and what values you need to set them for per game. So again, PCSX2 wiki. Find the settings if you need them. If you don't, you can basically ignore it. But once you have all the options set, you can go up to manage core options. You can save them as a game options file if you need to have per game settings. So for games that need specific hacks in that hack folder, you will want to save them as a game options file so that way they don't apply them to every single PS2 game when you're playing. But that's going to do it for core options. One last little fun thing you could do if you so desire, you can head down to the shaders tab. You can turn shaders on. Load up a shader preset. So something I like is a uh, shader... Uh, CRT easy mode just gives a nice overall look to the th to the games and um, not overly intrusive like some shaders can be. Shaders are very personal preference, so there's really no best shader option. Just choose which one you like and go with it. You can save shaders as a core preset, game preset, just anything under the sun. So I'm just going to go ahead and save easy mode as a core preset here. So that way, every time I load up a PS2 game, it will be ready to go for me. But now that I've gone through and changed a number of different settings, I'm just going to close out of the content. And since RetroArch seems to not want to load my PS2 games up again unless I restart it, I'm just going to manually do that real quick. And now I'm going to go back into Devil May Cry 3 here. So you'll see in the bottom left there, it found and applied a widescreen patch for Devil May Cry 3. It looks like there was no deinterlacing patches, so you can see that the image is kind of bouncing. So that's one of the things. If you don't have an interlace patch available for that specific game, it can negatively impact the image quality. But there we go. Here is Devil May Cry 3 Special Edition. Running in a 1440 resolution output type deal in widescreen. And it's pretty cool that the widescreen patches actually apply to in-game and menus separately. So the menus are still showing up in 4x3 and not stretched. So you could get some really cool effects out of PCSX2 on RetroArch. It's definitely come a long way in the last year. It's pretty cool stuff.
And for those of you wondering about the black borders around the screen, that's because I had integer scaling turned on. So if I were to turn that off, it would fill the full image, but I like having proper pixel ratios. So personal choice on that one, as I said in the initial setup video for RetroArch. But that's going to do it for PCSX2 for this video. As always, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to ask in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to try to help you out. But now, if you could all do me a couple of huge favors, first of all, please be sure to hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't done so already, hit that sub button so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Lots of content always coming your way, so happy to have each and every one of you along for the ride. For those of you that might be interested in further helping support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link that will pop up in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing you content just like this. Big shout out to all the current champions. Thank you so much for believing what we do here and helping us keep it going. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome and we'll see you back next video.